get seated and we'll get started here. There's, I, I'm going to dispense with the long introduction uh, so we can get you as much information as possible. But my name is David Frame, and I'm um, uh, a veterinarian. I'm the, ex the extension poultry specialist for Utah State University. And um, so I think we're going to talk a little bit more about things that are more warm and fuzzy than maybe a spider and a wasp, I hope, in, in this presentation. If we could, Katie, that's all right with you. So. <laughs> but um, it's kind of hard to put in 45 minutes everything to do with poultry. But um, what I'd, first of all, how many own chickens? OK, good. So we have a little bit of a. Um, background then on what's going on there. Um, Dennis, is there a changer? Oh, that one, OK. Very good, appreciate it. OK. You know, I really like this picture, because I think it just kind of encapsulates uh, um, how a lot of people feel about chickens. I don't, maybe you don't all, but uh, at least I, I really enjoy um, chickens right from the, the warm and fuzzy get-go until uh, yeah, eat them for dinner, but we're not going to talk about eating them for dinner here. <laughs> we're going to talk uh, hopefully a little bit about uh, the enjoyment of, of chickens and, uh, and why, why folks raise, raise birds. Uh, one reason I raise them, used to raise them, I can't anymore because of my job, because of biosecurity situations. I work with, with commercial industries and, and poultry all the time, and so uh, with that, I can't raise my own chickens anymore, but I used to raise... Uh, exhibition birds, uh, a lot of them, uh, mainly uh, Plymouth Rocks and some um, Old English game. But um, I enjoyed raising chickens. This is how I got into it, is by showing birds. And uh, my father and I would, would raise uh, chickens, breed them, and, and uh, show them in, in shows uh, in various places uh, clear into California. And so we, we enjoyed that. So, so that's something that some people really like about chicken raising. Um, others have a, just like to have a few in their backyard, uh, you know, for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, for whatever reasons happened in about 2009, um, when we went into the economic uh, situation, um, there was an upsurge in, in folks wanting to uh, have a few hens in their backyard, a few laying hens particularly. And, um, at that time, there was uh, also a, an, an upsurge of municipalities uh, wondering and scrambling on what to do about all this. You know, people wanting to have chickens in their backyard in, in suburbia, you know. And, um, and for about a year, I, I received calls clear from um, Moscow, Moscow, Idaho, clear into all areas of the West on... on um, city planners and things calling, you know, what do we do about this? And, and uh, I think it's settled down now. Most, uh, most places realize the benefits, hopefully, of allowing folks to have chickens in their backyard. And, and with that, uh, there's been a lot of uh, thought put into this by different people on how can we integrate chickens into our yards and, and make, a, make the landscape look good, designer chicken coops, basically. And, uh, this is a good opportunity for kids and, and children to really get an off, a chance to raise something and know where their food comes from, you know, where that egg comes from, where, where the chickens come from. And this is just one type of building that uh, I had seen and that I'll talk about a little bit more later. And there's just something about uh, sitting on your back porch and, and seeing some hens wandering around. These are some um, black sex link of some sort that uh, we raised in a, in a project at Utah State. And uh, uh, this is early spring, and um, I believe, or maybe it's, maybe it's in the fall, but uh, they're out there, and the wind's blowing, they just look pretty, and uh, there's something aesthetic about that. People, some people actually raise chickens for pets, and, uh, you know, like, like a pet dog or a pet cat. Um, the only caution on something like that is you've got to realize a chicken is not a, not a dog or a cat, and it takes some, some different care and things. And so it's important that whenever you get your birds that you understand uh, some poultry husbandry, because it is different than, 
than raising a turtle or whatever. You know, it's just like anything else. You have to learn about it. And um, the worst case is, is in the spring that you go down to the go down to, to uh, these feed stores or something, and, and per particularly for families, and, and uh, one of the kids say, hey, you know, I want one of those turkeys in there, or I want one of those little fuzzy chickens or whatever, and so they buy this thing, and they're not prepared to how to take care of it, uh, what needs to be done, and so on the way home they say, now what, you know, and uh, it's, that's not a good thing. If you're going to get into them, be sure you understand um, what it's going to take to brood these these birds have every have your waters, your feeders, and everything in place before you ever buy the the animal itself. That's the last thing you get is the animal. Um, some other things is remember that when whenever you have animals, you're going to have feed, you're going to have litter, you're going to have uh, um, feces and that type of stuff. So plan into what you're going to do with all that stuff before um, you, you know you get into it. Um, you want to make sure that you know how to how to uh, control your rodent population, particularly. That's one of the big things with chicken raising. But just some good management, good neighbor practices. Remember that birds fly. I mean, certain types. If you get into bantam chickens, for instance, you know it's hard to keep them down. I mean, they they're light enough; they can fly and go all over. And they don't res they don't understand that that fence says don't go in there. And so there's a couple of reasons you don't want to do that. First of all, if the neighbor happened to ha happens to have a dog or a cat or something, you could lose your bird, you know, uh, or uh, it gets into your neighbor's tomatoes and then you have problems, you know, things like that. So keep that in mind as far as restraint goes. And then just remember that you don't need roosters. If you just want some egg production in, in, your, in your yard, um, hens will do just fine laying the eggs for you and, and so forth. And uh, um, Another common mistake or misconception, I guess, that I find with a lot of people is that they say, okay, I want some eggs. And so they go out and, and the, say the ordinance says you can have 10 hens in your backyard, okay? So you go out and you buy 10 chickens and they grow up and they start laying eggs. Well, what's, what's a normal egg production percentage of, of chickens? Okay, it's usually about 75 to 85 percent, you know, when they're in peak production. So uh, you have 10 chickens that are all the same age. They all pretty much grow up together. They mature basically at the same time. They start laying eggs. If you have 10, e 10 chickens, how many eggs a day are you going to get? Seven to eight eggs a day, you know, at peak production. What do you do with them? If there's only uh, a couple of people in the family, you know, that's a lot of eggs to be eating. And, and uh, then you have to figure out some way to, you know, use those eggs. And, and so keep that in mind, too. For a, If you have a large family, maybe 10 chickens. But... Ten chickens may be fine, but, uh, you know, six, I think most city ordinances have somewhere around six hens, I, I think is a normal, um, it varies, but six is a good number, you know, for an average family. <coughs> First thing is make sure you understand what the restrictions and the, the rules are in your community. And each one is different, um, you know, it would take us three days to go through all the uh, ordinances of the different communities, and to tell you the truth, I really don't know them. I know what the generalities are that most of them are doing, but uh, make sure you understand what that is. And if you, in some places, may require a permit, others may not. Just be sure you know what to do. And what about sick or dead birds? Is it legal in your area to put a dead carcass in the garbage can on the road where the garbage truck picks it up? Is it legal to bury it? You know, just make sure you know of those type of things because sooner or later uh, you deal with live animals, you're going to have to deal with dead animals too. And then make sure you understand what, uh, what your local laws are too as far as uh, if you decide to sell additional eggs or whatever. And the one thing that uh, you have to keep in mind too is that the commercial poultry industry in the state of Utah is pretty significant in the total agricultural economy of the state. And uh, those, those folks go to great lengths for biosecurity and for health of their birds, and, and we don't want to do anything that jeopardizes the, the possibility of disease getting into those flocks, and, uh, because that could really be devastating. And so we want to make sure we understand um, some good biosecurity um, 
practices for our own flocks, just so that we can keep our own birds healthy too, and that we don't go over to, the, to our neighbors. For instance, your neighbor has a sick chicken, and he calls you up and says, you know, come over here and take a look at this bird. It doesn't look right. And so you go over and you get in there and you pick the bird up or whatever and you look at it. Yeah, you're right, it's sick. And then you go back and gather your eggs. You know, that's not a very smart thing to do because there's some very contagious diseases that can cause some problems. Oh, shoot, I thought I left this slide out, sorry. <laughs> but this is to introduce pest control. So, <laughs> so snakes will get little <laughs> birds like that occasionally, but uh, what you want to do is you want to make that environment as inhospitable as you can for whatever pest you have. And, and some of these uh, nice designer coops are great because they're off the ground, you know, and that type of thing. But just make sure you keep your feed stored properly and, um, and dispose of litter when you take it out of your buildings uh, in the right way. A, a good way to use, your, use litter is to compost it and put it in your garden. I mean, that's a great, great way to do it. Now, one caution, though, is to make sure that you compost it. You can put just a little bit of raw litter in the garden, but what will have a tendency to build up, particularly in the litter, is that you'll get a little bit of salt uh, build up in there. And then the other thing, too, is if you don't have enough nitrogen to your, to your shavings ratio, then you're going to deplete the ni nitrogen balance there. And if you have too much, then you can burn your garden, too. So um, I recommend uh, finding a place, using it for composting, and then you've got some really good stuff. Why do you want to con control these things? And we talked about the insects, uh, how to keep them alive. I'm not going to tell you how to kill them. I'm not going to talk about the, the rodents mainly, but uh, the, the problem is, is that they can become a public nuisance. Whenever you have live animals of any kind in a, in a confined area, um, there's going to be a tendency to be a little more um, food available. And chicken feed is perfect mouse feed. I mean, they love that kind of stuff. And so you have to kind of watch that and make sure that that uh, you don't want to uh, cause an upsurge of rodent population, but the other thing too is they can transmit diseases. Both that infect the chickens and, and potentially can, can affect mammals too. Um, here's, a, here's a little gadget that works really well, um, particularly in areas that game bird places you have used this, and, and they, they swear by it, but uh, you take some PVC pipe and you use about an inch and a half diameter pipe and you just uh, make a T with it and you can get one of those screw cap covers on the top and you put these along the walls and the w reason I like these is because whatever you put into it to re reduce your rodent population um, dogs can't get in there, kids can't get in there, you know nothing can really access that bait and, and the mice will run along, go in there, eat a little bit, go out, and eventually die. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of different types of uh, rodenticides that you can use there. Um, but one question I get all the time is, okay, if I've killed m these mice with something, and they, they die, and a chicken eats them, what's going to happen? Well, uh, I've never seen a chicken poisoned by eating a poisoned mouse, but, I, but chickens for some reason, we'll kind of pick at them if they happen to die in the coop. Sometimes they die and go other places, too. I suppose that's a potential, but I've never seen it. Uh, I just don't think there's enough um, uh, poison in a, in a given dead mouse to really poison a good-sized laying hen, but usually um, you'll find them and get them out of there. And that's the thing you want to do, too, is make sure you clean up um, any dead that you find to keep them away from the birds as much as possible. Now here's just a few examples of some cool coops. Um, there's just all kinds of different things. The sky's the limit and, and it's imagination. I'm not very artistic, so my design of a chicken coop, what I did is I worked with Snow College Carpentry Shop and we tried to design the ideal coop. Well, there's not such thing. I mean, chickens are very adaptable, coops are very adaptable, it's just up to your own style and there's a few things we'll talk about that are basic for it, but you can get all kinds of just interesting looking things. Here's one, for instance, that has a little walkway that the chickens can go up into. Uh, notice how they're, they're up off the ground. Um, I would probably, in real cold climates, suggest maybe insulating these, uh, you know, so that it keeps the chill off. You, chickens can take pretty, much, pretty cold weather, but if, if, if they're in the wind 
and uh, it's, it's really cold, and then, of course, the wind chill will cause some problems, too, and you can get some frozen cones and things. But basically, if you have a, a decently um, enclosed building, they can stay pretty well. Uh, one rule of thumb that I always use is if the water keeps freezing really quickly, then maybe you better stick a light or something in there to kind of take the edge off, you know. But here's one. This is a real small one for just a few birds, and there's the, the nest. You can open them up. This is my favorite, though. It looks like a barn. It's on the, and kind of like, like this big wagon. You, you can gather your eggs right there, and you can just move, the, move this thing around. And, um, and this is the one that I thought was, was pretty good, too. This guy built this thing from scratch, and it looks like a commercially made uh, building. But he's got his, his huge uh, a door right there where he can scrape the litter out. Um, the nest box is in the back here where you can lift that up. And then in the front, I think I got a better view. Yeah, in the front, uh, you've got outside run for them. They can be right down on the ground, um, eating the grass or whatever you want to put them. Then they go back up and roost. And I don't think I have an inside shot, but they have some roosts in there um, also. And this is, this is part that's kind of interesting. He's, he's just uh, used these casters on a flip out a board there. And so when he wants to move them, he just lifts it up a little bit, that thing falls underneath, and then he can move it around the yard or wherever he wants it, you know. Place here where he can get in and gather the eggs, clean those nest boxes out, and go from there. Let's talk about some basic uh, uh, equipment that you want in any building. Where, however you decide to, to build this thing, you want to have some place for the chickens to get into a, into a secluded area and lay their eggs. If you don't, you'll get a lot of what's called floor eggs, and they'll just lay in a corner somewhere. And, and that's really not the best idea, because they, then they can get feces on the eggs and get them dirty and, and uh, step and tread on them and that kind of thing. So um, just as a general rule of thumb, and, and there's a lot of variation here too, but if, you have, if you're building your nest from scratch, uh, you want something about a foot deep, and, and you want something over the front too um, to keep the, the material the bedding inside those nests. That's important. You want to have something in there because if they're laying eggs on either dirty uh, boards in there or hard boards, you're going to have cracked eggs, you're going to have dirty eggs, and, and you don't want that kind of a situation. Here's just some examples of some nests. This was the most creative, that, well, one of the most creative I've seen. Uh, they actually just took a fruit box, you know, and uh, stuck it over a laundry box and shoved them between two boards. They had two or three of these things. And these, they, they had some other types of nests in there too, and these chickens actually preferred this makeshift nest. Now, then, also, it, was, it had a bottom, so a lot of this straw fell out, you know, so you had to keep replenishing it, but it kept the material clear. Here's more of a commercial type uh, nest box. Um, now, the rule of thumb is, is you want one nest box per five hens, but don't go by that rule of thumb. I always have more nest boxes than you think you're going to need. And there's a number of reasons for it. It's just like we prefer different types of housing uh, and, and, and beds. Chickens will, may like a different type of nest. And so um, you may have more shy birds using one over here and more aggressive ones over here. Um, having said that, I can tell you that you're going to put in five nest boxes and have five hens, and all five hens will try to nest in one box. And, and, that's, uh, and then what you have to do is try to figure out why they're doing that. You know, is it a little bit darker than the others? Is it more secluded or something like that? And try to provide some opportunities for them to uh, spread out a little bit. Um, if, if you all have them nesting in the same box, what are some problems there? What? Okay, one go, goes in, lays an egg, another one comes in, has its little toenails, you know, breaks an egg, steps on it, whatever, as it's laying an egg. Um, has anybody had to deal with broken eggs and chickens really liking to eat broken eggs? That's a real, that's one of the worst contagious diseases that you can get into. And so um, that's one reason, um, obviously. And now another reason could be, depending on what, what strain of chickens you're using too, yes. You know, you ought, to, you ought to try to breed that thing and see if you can get something in there. Just have a little softer on the mouth and you have, a, have automatically egg gathering. 
Um, depending on the breed, now if you're d dealing with some of these more commercial strains like these white leggings that are uh, commercial bred, they are bred to continue egg production without going what's called broody. And this is a change in the hormonal um, makeup of the brain. And uh, what they want to do is they lay a natural chicken. Let's take a red jungle fowl. It, it'll, it'll lay a clutch of eggs, maybe six eggs or whatever, and then the hen wants to lay on them. I mean, she wants to set on them. She wants to hatch little babies. And so if you have um, a nest and you have five hens going in there, every time they go in that nest, they're going to see an egg. And then they start thinking that their, their brood is starting to get to the, the, their clutch is starting to get to the point where they need to brood it. And uh, so you can start having hens go broody. And once they go broody, they don't, uh, they don't lay eggs. You know, then you have to break them up and, and get them started again. So there's a, there's a number of reasons for that. Here's, a, here's some nests that are, uh, notice how it's under the window, so the window's not shining directly onto it. Um, here's a whole set of them. You don't want them, you want them at least 18 inches off the ground, but you don't want them so high that the chickens have to jump or um, fly to get into them because you will start getting some broken eggs that way. And another thing you might get are some more eggs with blood spots in. The, the way you get blood spots, the most common way that blood spots come in, in your eggs is as the chicken is ovulating, um, there's, and I'll show you a picture here in a minute, there's a, a part called a stigma where the stigma where the yolk comes off the ovary. And uh, those little capillaries will break, and, and they break. Uh, if, they're, if these chickens are jostled around during that time of ovulation, um, that's when you're going to start having more of your, your blood spots. Uh, here's one that's um, just on the outside where you can gather them. So there's a, there's a bunch of ways. Now, uh, this is a bad picture, I know, but this is actually quail. What I want to show you is not the quail, but you can buy some netting that's uh, pretty lightweight that you can put over large runs of, of where your chickens are um, for two reasons. First of all, you want to keep your chickens in. But the main reason is, is to try to keep your other birds and, and other things out of there. Um, and so there, there's a number of ways to do it fairly cheaply. OK, don't forget the water. Uh, we're going to go through this really fast. But I, uh, the, again, the guideline is uh, you want at least two quart pounds per 25 chicks, one gallon per 25 um, birds. But, uh, Again, the rules of thumb really don't apply because if you have one chicken in there or if you have 10 chickens, um, you need more than one water, OK? Now, what are some reasons why you would want to have more than one water? OK, yeah, good. So if they're out in the run, at least they have access to it and stuff. That's a good reason. Others? OK, Murphy's Law is <laughs> you go out, put the water in, go to work, and one falls over. That, that's, that's the main reason right there. The pecking order is real. And you're going to have chickens. Uh, if you have a flock of chickens, no matter how big the flock is, they're going to start getting into a hierarchical uh, situation. And you may have a, a shyer bird that doesn't get to get to the water as often as some of the more aggressive ones. What happens to egg production in a bird that doesn't drink? This is, this is um, a nipple water that you can buy for pennies on, on the internet. And, uh, this is, is really a cool thing, because you can screw these things into the bottom of a five-gallon bucket, hang them up. Um, you can run pipe, either PVC pipe uh, there, and then screw them in uh, along the lines or whatever. And uh, the, the pressure in these buckets is, is just right for these nipple drinkers. And, and the reason I like this for is because you can put a lid on, on the top. You don't want to cut the total air off, obviously, as it goes down. But uh, um, it's, a, it's a closed system. Here's a closed system. See, the, that is what the, the bird drinks. And so it keeps the water cleaner. Uh, if you have to medicate or do something, you can keep it in there. But, uh, it, or, or chlorination is a, is a good thing, too, that a closed system will keep in if you do that. And uh, you don't spread disease all the way down a trough or something like that. Luis? It drinks from this thing right there. This thing? OK. These are basically the same thing. It's. Uh, this, that you just drill a hole in the bottom of the bucket, screw those things in. It, and the chicken, yeah, you want to have a high enough. They have to have their, their beak up. Now, I would not recommend putting four in, in a bucket. I'd put three at the most. 
Uh, but have a couple of those. They're cheap to make. The pennies on, you know, for just pennies, you can find a bucket like that and put those things in. Then the other advantage is if you can hang them from something, they're not going to spill over and tip over as much, too, and it'll keep uh, rodents and things off, too. And the same principle goes for your, your feeders. If you use bucket feeders, if you hang them from a wire off the floor, you're going to have less problems with mice and things getting into it. But that's not to say that they can't, because I've seen mice come right down a, a wire. But uh, you're going to reduce that a lot. Yes. That can be a problem. Now, it's the worst problem in turkeys. You'll kill all your turkeys if you don't wean them off onto this thing. If they're on an open water of some sort, like those plissons or something, um, it, you can't expect a bird, you know, his brain's that big, you can't expect a bird to know, okay, that's where my water source is. Now, chickens adapt a lot better than, than turkeys, but what you want to do is, is introduce um, one of those into, the, into the, them immediately if you, when you get them, but have other waters there until they learn how to, to do it. Because if you just take them away, um, if they're used to drinking out of a cup, for instance, um, and you take all those cup drinkers away, cold turkey, and have one of these lines there, yeah, you can have some problems. That's a good point. Good point. We're going to skip all this stuff. Molting uh, is something I want to um, briefly talk on. I think in the book I've got those uh, fact sheets on it, but this is a natural response, okay? Chickens are going to molt regardless, um, but uh, there's ways that, that um, they can molt that will help you stay in egg production better. That's the reason why commercial people do what they call force molt. The, they actually make the birds go in, uh, into a molt so they can get back into production. Otherwise, they get, they, the, their egg production gets really bad. They get more prone to disease and all kinds of stuff. But they will molt in a, in a specific way. And um, uh, you notice that, uh, let's take starlings, for instance. Uh, they, have a, they molt, too. I'll, Wild birds molt, but in the fall, um, you'll notice that, um, and in the winter time, the starlings have these little white speckles all over the, their, their, their wings. Um, they'll molt once a year in the fall, and that's what they get. Now in the spring, what do they look like? They're all shiny and, and things. And you think, well, they've molted all those feathers out. Well, they haven't molted those feathers. What they've done is they've worn off the white, and, it's gone, and now they look shiny, and now they're ready to mate. So some birds will molt like that once a year. Some birds will molt twice. Chickens basically will molt um, once a year once they're adults, okay? And we can talk about the juvenile molts and everything, but we don't have time. So generally in the fall, when the light production goes down, they'll start molting. Now, uh, it's just like with everything else with chickens. You talk about theor theory, but things are a little bit different. But uh, the point here is, is that early molters that molt early in the fall or whenever they molt, um, if they can lose their feathers really slowly. But, and late molting hens will produce, long, produce longer before molting, that, the egg production, but, and will shed the feathers quicker. The advantage of late molters is that, they, that the loss of feathers and the replacement takes place at the same time, and this enables the hen to return to full production sooner. The two, the two energy sources in chickens uh, for molting, or that are, are big in chickens is lay production and molting. And so uh, you don't want them to do that at the same time if you can help it. Here's just a wing uh, of a Rhode Island red showing the, the different feathers um, on the wing. And I've got 10 minutes, so I just want to tell you about egg production really quickly, just so you have some idea about it. This is the, this, whoops, sorry. This is the um, oviduct of a hen. This is the, the, the uh, ovary, and every egg yolk, every egg that a hen will ever produce in its entire life is present when it's hatched. Okay? You never have to worry about it running out of eggs, though, because there's over 10,000 of these little creatures in here. But he here's what happens is there's a, a, a membrane around there. The stigma is a place that opens up and allows this O this ovum or this yolk to fall into the into the tract itself, and this is what I was talking about. If they get jostled during the time of ovulation, then uh, a lot of times these little vessels will break. So it falls in here and uh, it comes down the tract at a certain time span in each of these these areas. Um, 
I'm giving some presentations next, next month. And if any of, are, of you are interested, watch out for that. For those, there's one with lifelong learning. I think it is with U University of Utah. There's a two-night session, and there's one with Utah um, University with the uh, UVU in, in Provo too. And we'll go into this in a lot more detail. But what I want to tell you today is that you look and see that it takes a little over 24 hours for a hen to lay an egg from start to finish. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why they lay later every day. Um, and, and they go through a clutch, and then sometimes after they've laid a clutch of eggs, uh, uh, they may skip a day and then start again. Ovulation occurs um, at 20 minutes. This is interesting. At 20 minutes, not 28 or 30 minutes or 23 minutes, right after the egg is laid. And if you're raising chickens for fertility, um, there's 20 minutes that... This thing has to be uh, fertilized within three minutes, okay? Once it's put it out in the inf infundibulum. The sperm is actually stored in glands down here at the bottom of the oviduct, and, and those glands will release sperm at the time of, of oviposition, or at the time the egg is laid, and they have 20 minutes to get up to the top there and fertilize that, and be there ready to go by the time that thing drops, and then they've got three minutes to fertilize. So it's, it's, it could be, but actually with one insemination, they have enough uh, sperm in these glands to, that they can, they can uh, fertilize eggs for two weeks. So. Okay, day length is important. Um, in the natural world, hens will lay their, their chicks in the spring. Um, you have increasing day length, and then they mature in the, in the fall. And then, uh, by that time, they've become sexually mature enough that in the spring, the day length is what triggers uh, reproduction. And so that's the reason why now your hens will probably start laying eggs a lot more than they did, say, in November, December. And sometimes there's, a, there's kind of a dip there in that, in that winter time. And it's not the cold that's the problem. Uh, it's the, actually the daylight. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in there that's kind of interesting. But anybody seen colored eggs? Uh, what, what's... What, what causes colored eggs? Okay, first of all, it's the breed. There's Araconas and Americanas that'll do it, and if they have that, uh, that in their bloodline, and it's also dominant, and so you can get some different colored eggs. These are all eggs from one flock. Uh, they're quite interesting. Um, and here's some of those eggs broken out. And the way you tell a fresh egg is, is you, can, you can see that the, what's called the thick albumin just around the yolk, keeps that, that yolk way up. Anybody have any idea what the, those white things are on the side? Okay, that, that, it's protein. It's called chalazia. And the chalazia will actually keep that yolk um, inside there kind of strapped together so that it doesn't jostle around too much. And uh, this is an indication of a real fresh egg is when you have a lot of chalazia there. There's, that just shows you that this is a... A, a top egg here that's as fresh as can be. It's got a lot of chalazy. The yolk is kept way up. The, the thick albumin goes out there quite a way. Uh, if you do have anything, any questions on, on what you do, if you have to sell eggs or whatever, contact the grading uh, department, department of Ag up there, and they can give you the, whatever information that you need. Uh, no. But just go to utah.gov or... or Department of Ag. Just Google Department of Ag and they'll get you there. This is a really good book that uh, I recommend, you know, for folks, even if they've raised chickens for a while. It just has some uh, good objective information in it. It talks a little bit about housing and, and disease and all kinds of good stuff. I just wanted to show you these. Uh, these are Yokohamas, and uh, I found these in a magazine. And look at the size of those sickles uh, and main tail feathers on those, those birds. Uh, can you imagine trying to keep those clean and neat? Uh, this is a frizzle, and uh, it's bred so that its uh, feathers kind of curl back, and it looks like it's got a fur coat on or something. Um, this is a Wyandotte uh, variety or breed, and this is actually a, a male here, a rooster. And here's one of my favorites. I used to raise these, too. These are white rose comb, and... Uh, the, this is a, a female, but on those males, I don't think I've got a picture of a male, but those white uh, 
earlobes will just be huge, and they're enamel white, and uh, they have uh, big, broad feathers on the tails. And pe people who show these will actually uh, iron the feathers before they between towels, you know, before they bring them to the show to get the. There's cochins. I think we're, most of us have probably seen these feathery birds with the with the feathers all the way down and the feathered legs and things. There's a black <coughs> cochin female, and and there's a male. And these things are just uh, just beautiful birds. And uh, silkies. Um, silkies are interesting because they have blue skin. Uh, they ha another thing, they have five toes. But the most interesting thing is they have blue skin, and it's also dominant. But in Asian markets, they really like that blue skin type uh, bird. And there's a white one that's a male there. This is actually a, a Belgian diacle, um, and it's a millefleur color pattern on, on that. Notice how there's three, three colors for each feather. Um, there's an old English game, black. And there's a brown red female. And there's a. OK. I think that's it. If, you wanna, if you're after egg production, you, you want to get, um, they've got commercial strain white egg layers, and they've got commercial strain brown egg layers. Okay, if, you're ac if you're actually looking economically for that. Otherwise, it's up to, it's whatever fits your fancy. That's why there's over you know, 60 breeds of chickens and 200 varieties. I mean, um, there, there's really not a lot that are more disease resistant or that. There's some, the, the sea brides, for instance, are a little more susceptible to Marek's disease. And some, there's some strains of birds that are. But basically, it's just whatever, whatever you like. Now, the, the bantams are really good for small gardens because they can get in there and scratch around and not uproot trees and everything, you know. And they can help with pest control and things like that, too. Yes. Well, the, the, general, the general recommendation is you keep different breeds and different species separate. And particularly if you get into waterfowl, uh, ducks are worse than geese, but uh, waterfowl are natural carriers of some diseases that you can get into your chickens that can cause some problems. Uh, they're so different that you really need a different uh, um, housing situation for ducks and geese than you would with chickens and so and and turkeys the same thing you want want differently there so the recommendation is there's not a one size fits all really on it but generally a couple of weeks um, what it, once they go through it they've basically been vaccinated you know you know so they're they're resistant to it and they're not going to get you know re they're not going to get sick again from it but it uh, but they can't you get a naive bird coming in yes they can give it to them. Um, no, uh, they, about two to three weeks after they've they've been become exposed, they create antibodies and then they become um, um, resistant to it. Uh, but also with Newcastle disease, they won't shed it very much. Some diseases will, even though the chicken goes through it. Okay. All right. You pick. You pick who who gets the question. Okay. The, way, the only way you're going to get rid of mycoplasma and to contain it for everybody else is, get, is, is total depopulation. But if, if you're depopulated for a couple of weeks, you're, you know, and then repopulate, you'll be fine. Um, and there's, there's little chance of spreading that way. But you'll never get rid of it as long as there's, there's carrier birds on the place. Because it's a little bit different than Newcastle. I mean, those things will carry it for the rest of their life and spread it. So. Sparrows are kind of a transient carrier of it. Uh, house finches are actually worse. They, they can carry the disease differently. They, they actually have a mycoplasma that, that finches get, house finches get. But it's not the same thing as MG, what you're talking about.